Mujeres, voten por el FMLN. Women, vote for the FMLN. I can't get it off me. It's too heavy, the young teenager said, as sweat accumulated around his temples. The droplets were blending into his long, dusty bangs. Another teenager was with him. Yes, you can. Just count to three with me. On three, imagine we've won the war and we can eat all the meat and cheese pupus as we want. One, two, three. Ah! The boys managed to push the bricks from the crumbled building off their torsos. Now they had just a few seconds to gather their bags and weapons and run as fast as they could. In theory, they could stay and fight, but they'd been trained to avoid fighting on the army's initiative. They had to flee back into the safety of the mountains. This was El Salvador during the Civil War. If you were poor in El Salvador, life was usually a living hell where rapists paraded around in daylight hours. Men, boys, children, grandmothers, grandfathers, mothers, sisters, daughters, cousins, aunts, or any poor female for that matter could be kidnapped and murdered if they were labeled as guerrillas or sympathizers. The military was constantly raiding the villages in the countryside. They were fond of young women to such an extent that they'd commonly accuse women of being guerrillas just to rape them. All they had to do was enter the countryside and accuse a female of being a guerrilla or a sympathizer. The military establishment in El Salvador encouraged this to terrorize the population from joining, helping, or sympathizing with the guerrillas. They called it counterinsurgency measures which was a term that their teachers at Fort Benning, Georgia, used. First, they'd accuse women and interrogate them. If the women were civilians, they would say they knew nothing of the guerrillas. Those that were guerrillas or sympathizers would also deny any ties to the movement. To the government soldiers, it was all the same. The majority of them really didn't care whether they were guerrillas or not. They wanted to make examples of the women and live out, live out despicable power fantasies at the same time. The irony is that the government soldiers shared the same class status, culture, and traits as the peasants they preyed on. But they were armed with guns and heavy weaponry that their sponsors up north were testing for field effectiveness. Their school of the Americas training mentality and tactics were brutal. The soldiers would gang rape women for hours, beat them, and then cut their throats. Then they'd shoot them in the head. To wage psychological war on the FMLN guerrillas and their sympathizers, they'd discuss what they'd done over shortwave radios and codes that guerrillas knew, laughing about it as they shared details of the women. The army soldiers must have never, thought, never been thoughtful enough to understand that at one time in space these women were small infants, adorable, helpless, and dependent on their parents. And their parents had probably never imagined that these girls would meet this fate. Many women were dealt a hard hand because they were poor, illiterate, and the elites in El Salvador saw them as nothing. God willing, saints prayed that angels descended on them during their ordeal and gently pulled away their souls. Justice dictates that the opposite happened to the criminals that did this to them. This kind of devastation on peasant women happened so much that by 1980, a guerrilla group was established to specifically track down the particular death squads that were responsible. The leader of this unit was a 12-year-old boy named Nico. He'd witnessed, he'd witnessed the military kill his mother. She was grinding corn on her metate one humid evening when a convoy of soldiers entered the hamlet. Less than two, two minutes of dialogue passed before they slammed her to the floor. The soldiers joked about how she was too old to get raped. They shot her five times. Nico was hiding behind a chair. He would never again be afraid the way he was that day. He wanted to fight, find the death squad that was responsible for Mi Mama's death. After his mother's death, he asked his father if he could join the guerrillas. His father objected. Nico ran away a few days later. He began as a messenger for a small guerrilla group near a mountainous area. He carried a plastic jug full of water that was bigger than him in case he would bump into an army squad. It was common for the villagers to transport water this way. He was one of the best messengers. The guerrillas seldom used radios to communicate to each other. 
they assumed that virtually all forms of communication were under surveillance. The courier method was effective in relaying minor tactical messages from one group to the other. Regardless of the trauma Nico had witnessed, he had a cheery spirit. He liked disco and he would shake his hips to music. The boy could have been a child from any part of the Latin third world in the late 1970s. and early 1980s. He was active, thin, and had long, healthy, shiny hair. He was handsome and always kept himself clean. His features were delicate yet masculine. His skin was that light brown that shines in the sun in an illustrious tone, the type of skin that people wish they could attain before they pay tanning parlors to burn them. The guerrilla commanders near the, near the Chalatenango area liked him. He was always successful in his missions and was a great scout and lookout. He dreamed of becoming a guerrilla commander, similar to the ones he relayed messengers for, messages for. Once he asked Comandante Ramon, will I be able to grow a beard like you when I become a commander? Deep inside his soul, Nico felt that he would find the death squad that had killed his mother and that he would even, even the score. He always wrote to his mother in his diaries. 19 de mayo de 1980. Mamá, te extraño. Los guerrillas me van a ayudar. Vos sabes que soy un niño bueno y voy a ser un hombre que va a ayudar a cambiar el mundo. Cuando me veas otra vez, voy a tener una barba larga y negra como la noche. Y vos me vas a hacer mis pupusas de pollo con arroz. Mamá, te amo. Nico, mensajero para el FMLN. May 19th, 1980. Mom, I miss you so much. The guerrillas are going to help me. You know that I'm a good boy, and I will be a man that will help change the world. When you see me again, I'll have a long black beard like the night, and you will make me my chicken pupusas with rice. Mom, I love you. Nico, messenger for the FMLN. The guerrilla group that Nico was in, was in trained him in small arms, surveillance, and counter-surveillance. Nico at one time even begged the commander of the guerrilla group to send him to Cuba because he heard that the Cubans, the, <laughs> Nico at one time even begged the commander of the guerrilla group to send him to Cuba because he heard that the Cubans were great at guerrilla warfare. You already shine brighter than many stars, Nico. Just be patient and you will get what you want, Comandante Ramon told him. Nico just stared at Comandante Ramon, then he then spoke. I want to find the groups responsible and bring them to trial in the villages for what they've done to all the women. But if that can't be achieved, then I want to bring hell to them wherever they are. Nico would always repeat this to his group of 11 guerrillas that ranged in age from 12 to 19. Their mode of operating was simple. They were trained to infiltrate the countryside case and follow the positioning of a suspected army soldier, rape squad. This process took days, weeks, even months. Once they were ready, they would attack the soldiers, and if they were successful, they would steal their weapons and mark the area with pro-FMLN graffiti, with short, brief descriptions of why the soldiers were attacked, such as, here lay rapists, murderers, thugs, and enemies of the poor. Viva el FMLN. Before Nico was a young, battle-hardened guerrilla, he used to be a daydreaming schoolboy. Once his teacher asked him, Nico, what do you like to read the most? Out of anything you could think of, Nico, tell me what you would like to read about. I don't know, Ms. Dalton. Maybe I would love to read about food and cooking, Nico responded as his delicate, thin hand turned into a fist and held up his chin. Really? Well, when I go to San Salvador, I'll find you a book on cooking. Tell me why cooking. Boys your age love to read about cars, animals, chespirito. Every time I'm home and me mama is cooking, I love to watch her and help her. She makes the best pupusas, and her tamales are amazing. The banana leaves just slide off them, Nico answered. His love of cooking continued even as he became a gorilla. 
Nico, what are you cooking tonight? One of the teenage gorillas asked him one night after they had to huddle under a tiny tent because of the intense rain. Pupusas de papas, Nico said as his little eyes twinkled. His smile stretched as if someone had asked him if he wanted an expensive toy like the ones the San Salvador Sunday newspaper circulars advertised that were only available in the upscale malls. Pupusas de papas? No meat? Again? No cheese? No beans? Juanito asked as his eyes closed and his face frowned. His face had the someone stepped on dog doo-doo expression. I don't know when we'll have meat. Maybe when we finish this mission and return to the base. But we have enough potatoes to feed us for weeks, Nico answered, lowering his eyebrows as if he was about to get scolded. Food is food. And your pupusas are better than the ones in the stands of the capital, Miguelito, another gorilla said as he pushed the tent ceiling outward so that the water would fall off. Really, Miguel? You think my pupusas are good? Nico asked as he turned toward Miguel and focused his eyes on him. Of course, come on. You really don't know how good you cook, Nico. Lots of people cook because they're hungry, but you, you cook because you like to. When we win the war, you should write a book and work for the FMLN government in making sure that poor people eat well and they eat and that they eat the type of good food like you make. Hey, your mama taught you all that, Nico? Miguelito continued as he dried his hands and got closer to Nico. Nico's eyes were concentrated on Miguelito. Thank you, Miguel. Yes, mi mama taught me about food. And I also have this cookbook that Miss Dalton gave me before I left, Nico responded as he froze there, looking at Miguelito, as he had never seen him before. Ha ha, Nico only stayed in this village long enough to get that book from Miss Dalton. Cerote, cerote, Juanito teased as he giggled, pointing his index finger at Nico. She gave it to me the day that... I love the book. I already used me mama's cooking, and now I also combine the ideas from the book, Nico said in a matter-of-fact tone. So you want to be a gorilla or a chef, Juanito joked. Both. Viva la FMLN, Nico shouted. And Nico's pupusas, Miguelito added. A few days after the storm had passed and the rain had stopped, a gorilla group from Nico's group that was in another area visited Nico. The initial group of 12 would split into four groups of threes for easier mobility and to avoid detection, Gabrielito, and to avoid detection. Gabrielito was a soft-spoken but direct 16-year-old. He possessed qualities similar to Nico, and for that reason, he was a leader of one of the other subgroups. Nico, we found El Diablo, Gabrielito said as he made eye contact, then tilted his head towards the ground. What? Nico grabbed his jacket. His skin became full of goosebumps with a breeze that rushed through the tent. From the bre- from a breeze that rushed through the tent. Yes, we found out where he is. We've been tra- we've been trailing his squad for eight days. It's him, Nico. He has a pitchfork sign on his jeep. He even wears a symbol on his vest. When I found out it was him, we decided to relay our attack until I gave you the message. I'll follow whatever orders you want. Gabrielito said as he continued looking towards the ground. Nico just froze. His eyes and facial gestures were still as if he had just seen a ghost. He almost began to shake and sank into his coat. Yes, leave him to me, Nico murmured. El Diablo was notorious for raping women. Rumors had it he was the one that created the shortwave channel mentioned earlier to discuss his and his squad's acts against insurgents and sympathizers. El Diablo was also the soldier that had killed Nico's mama. The image of the pitchforks haunted Nico. He asked older gorillas what they meant after he had drawn an image of them. As late night approached, the boys prepared to move. Nico, Miguel, are you ready? Gabriel, are you coming with us? Nico asked as he stood up while wiping his eyes. Of course I'm ready, Miguelito responded, tightening his lips. Yes, we're coming with you, replied Gabrielito. Is there anyone? Is there any more pupusas de papas? Juanito asked in a soft tone. That night, the group 
the, that, not, that night, the attack group switched. Nico, Miguelito, and Gabrielito would be the attack group. Juanito, Ernesto, and Camilo would be the distraction group. The two groups cased out the area and watched for movement. The soldiers were known to drink and play games at night. The distraction group created a diversion by s starting a fire in an old farmhouse near the hamlet where the soldiers were. The soldiers were known to investigate situations in areas that weren't guerrilla territory. Nico's attack group was ready and planned to ambush the soldiers only after they had sighted El Diablo. The, distra the distraction group would initiate a gunfight and retreat into the jungle. Nico's group would follow the soldiers from behind. The fire raged for about 45 minutes until the soldiers finally investigated it. El Diablo, with all his symbols, stared at the barn as the flames pointed to the dark sky. Ah! Let it burn. Are the patrols sure there are no guerrillas in these areas? El Diablo asked his soldiers. This place has been pacified for a long time, Sergeant, one of the soldiers responded as the guerrillas aimed their weapons at the soldiers. Pra, ta, ta, pra, ta, ta. Instantly, six soldiers fell. It's an ambush. Let's get out of here, El Diablo yelled. He and four of his soldiers jumped onto the army jeep. Nico's group swift, swiftly approached from the dark and charged. Miguelito had a surprise. He had kept the grenade from a dead soldier and it saved it for a special event such as now. He threw it as hard as he could and sighed as he let it go. The inscription on the grenade made in the USA glistened from the light coming from the farmhouse flames as it traveled in the air towards its target. The grenade hit with a powerful boom. The jeep veered on to the side as bodies flew out of it. The bodies of the soldiers were spread out around the dark earth. Nico and the others ran towards them. Are they all dead? Where's El Diablo? Nico asked as he caught his breath. Yeah, they're dying. El Diablo's the one with the jeep on top of him, Gabrielito answered. He's still alive, Nico. Are you going to kill him or do you want me to slay him? Miguelito shouted. Nico stopped and stood without moving. He looked towards the sky. Tears began to run down his cheeks. A star twinkled in the distant dark sky. Then he looked towards the jeep that was partially engulfed in flames. No, save him. He'll stand trial at an FMLN court. Thank you.